right, good morning from Boston, everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, Dr. Diane Russo, I'm an Associate Professor of Optometry at the New England College of Optometry, and thank you for joining me for this talk today. So today, um, this lecture was designed to build on the previous two lectures that I gave on refraction. And so this one is more um, focused on prescribing specifically as opposed to the technique of refraction, um, like we talked about in the previous two webinars. So we'll be talking about uh, different variables like spectacle power and the patient's age and what their visual demands are and all the things that you might consider um, when coming up with the spectacle prescription. We'll also talk about um, the challenges to adapting to certain spectacle prescriptions and using techniques like trial framing to determine your final prescription. Uh, I did want to note at this um, part of the lecture that the lecture is mostly designed to focus on what um, I consider a, a primary care eye care population. Um, so it's not going to include more sort of complex specialty type cases um, like um, early pediatric cases or prescribing for amblyopia specifically or even low vision cases. Um, while pediatric care and low vision care may be part of a primary care practice, if I tried to include all of that in this lecture, we would never get through it. So I really confined it to probably the majority of patient encounters that you might come across in a primary care eye care setting. Um, so that is something I just wanted you to be aware of. I will include some reference material for pediatric prescribing for infants and children, um, but we will not have time. It's not within the scope to really go in depth in that area. Also, that is not my area of expertise um, specifically, so it would probably be better suited for someone else to um, go through those types of cases with you. But my hope is that we will, what we will cover today will really cover majority of spectacle prescribing in your practice. First, uh, if you've ever heard anyone talk about spectacle prescribing, you know, there's usually re references like there, it's a science and an art. You know, they talk about the art to spectacle prescribing. And the reason uh, that is referred to as an art is because it is. There are not always hard and fast rules, do this or don't do that. Uh, it's multifactorial. There are a lot of things that we consider for each patient case uh, when we're determining, you know, are they wearing current glasses? Um, are they happy with those glasses? What is the subjective refraction finding? Is it very different? Do we think they'll have trouble adapting? Because there are so many factors that we take into account, that's where this art of prescribing comes in. So first we'll start by talking about um, things that you would take into account if you're going to make a refractive change. So for someone that has an existing glasses prescription and you're thinking about changing it, what are some of the things that you should think about before you make the change? First, don't make a change unless it's needed. So uh, we can probably find prescription changes for every patient that comes in, there are normal variations that happen. But the first thing I would ask myself um, before making a change is, is this really needed? So is the patient happy with their glasses? Um, what is their current level of vision in the glasses? And uh, are the changes that I'm finding large or small? And are they actually making a difference? Are they making an improvement? Because if it's not improving the patient's vision or the visual function, and they're happy with their current glasses, then I'm not going to make a change. Even if I did find a change, I will not prescribe that in my final prescription. Some exceptions to this um, might be a case where um, someone is a latent hyperope and uh, maybe their distance vision is blurry, but they're functionally fine. They're not noticing any difference. And because I'm finding maybe a, a low to moderate amount of latent hyperopia, I may have a conversation with the patient and say, you know, this type of prescription might be really helpful for you at night. 
or if you're driving at night. Do you ever notice you have trouble um, seeing things at night, reading street signs, and then they might say, oh yeah, you know, I do. Um, so that might be a case, or a child that might have binocular or accommodative um, deficits. And so they may not be symptomatic, but I could within reason anticipate that they will have symptoms sometime in the near future. Those are the times where even if there are no symptoms or they're not having any issues with their current glasses, I may still prescribe. You also want to be um, aware and careful with patients that seem very sensitive to small prescription changes. Um, that's indicating that they're less, they have a lower tolerance to blur. And so any change that you make, while objectively it may seem small, maybe a quarter diopter of sphere or a quarter of diopter of cylinder, it could be very disruptive for them and very difficult to adapt to. And this is something that, you know, over time you develop that intuition uh, while you're going through the refraction, as you're changing the lenses, you'll start to notice how the patient is reacting. If you make a quarter diopter change and it seems very different, they have this big reaction, it made something very clear or very blurry. And those are some indicators that they might be sensitive to small changes. And if that's the case, you have to be very careful when um, whether to decide to make a, a change or not for the final glasses prescription. So this is also um, requires a little bit of math on our end. Uh, if you're rarely, if ever, reducing minus um, for myopic patients or reducing net plus power at near for presbyopic patients. Uh, so you really have to be careful with this and we'll go through a couple of examples so that you um, can see what I'm talking about. But with myopic patients, they're usually used to or habituated to their glasses prescription. And if you lower the prescription, they may interpret that as now it's blurry. Even if you are getting a lower myopic prescription on subjective refraction. So you may end up giving the higher minus, even though it seems like the patient doesn't need it, because that's what they're used to. And if you try and lower the amount of minus correction, um, they might perceive blur at that point. Presbyopes, you have to be careful with the overall effective power that they're reading through, um, because if you make changes to the distance prescription and don't take into account how that is impacting the near prescription, you could be taking, <laughs> you could be making a larger change to the near prescription and reducing the actual amount of plus power that they have at near, which would then result in blur or asthenopia. So let's go through some examples. So for, we have a 25 year old patient and their current prescription, their habitual RX that they come in wearing is minus three, minus 0 0.5 axis 180. And they're seeing 2020 through that. Their left eye is minus 325, minus 0.75 at axis 170. They're also seeing 2020 through that. You go through your subjective refraction, like we talked about in our first two webinars, and you're getting about half a diopter less minus um, in the sphere power for both eyes. And they're still seeing 2020. So, what do you prescribe? Well, um, you may think, well, maybe they're over minus by half a diopter, so I should cut back that minus. But if we go back to what we just talked about, you have to be very careful doing that. So if the patient's happy with their glasses, there's no complaint, there's no headaches, no eye strain, then I would just keep their prescription the same. I wouldn't make the change. If they were complaining and saying something like, I have headaches at the end of the day, or if I'm reading with my glasses on for a long time, or if I'm on the computer for a long time, and my eyes start to feel tired, or um, I start to get headaches, then I would probably prescribe the lower um, prescription. Um, but I would definitely include as part of the education that I am lowering the prescription, so, um, they may need to adjust, things may not seem quite as clear, um, but we're making the change for comfort. We're not making the change 
um, to improve acuity. Uh, and so um, that is something that I would include as part of the education. Oh, let's go back here. So next example, we have a 54 year old patient uh, and they come in wearing a prescription of minus three. So it's the same prescription that I gave for the last uh, example, but the acuities are a little bit different. So the acuity is reduced to 2030 uh, in each eye with their current glasses, but their reading, their near visual acuity is 2020 with a plus 150 add. Same thing on, uh, so now on subjective refraction, we're finding half diopter more uh, minus at distance, and that improves their distance acuity to 2020. But now the question is, what add do we give? So, because if we look at the previous uh, example, at, with a plus 150 add, we may say, oh, well, we're going to keep the plus 150 add because they were reading 2020 with it when they came in. The problem with that rationale is really what they were, the power that they were reading through, uh, if you take into account the distance prescription in the near add, in the right eye, the difference, you take the difference of the minus sphere power and the add power, they were really reading through a minus 1.5. And the left eye is reading through a minus 1.75. But with the changes that we made to the subjective refraction, if we kept that 1.5 add, they would now be reading through a minus two lens and a minus 225 lens. So now we would have increased the amount of minus that they would have to read through when looking through the near add if we kept a plus 150 add, right? Which the patient's not going to like that. Right. So they would have to accommodate even more, which they have, uh, you know, less of an accommodative reserve, reserve at 54. So in order to keep this effective near power the same, because they were 2020 when they entered uh, with their plus 150 add, you would actually have to give a plus two add to keep that effective near power the same. This is, and we're sort of walking through this step by step, looking at the math and overthinking this. Clinically, you would not have to overthink this quite as much uh, because one of the main things you'd be looking at when thinking about prescribing a near ad uh, would be their age and thinking about an age predicted ad, which we'll go over later in the lecture. But I wanted to walk you through the math step by step to show you how making a change in the distance prescription affects the near power and how we do want to make sure that we are not reducing the amount uh, of plus power that we're giving at near because of the changes that we may have made in the distance. Uh, if you are making uh, large changes to the sphere or cylinder power, you uh, may want to be careful about that. So if you're getting more than one diopter of sphere change, uh, you may not want to give all of it. You may want to give some and then change it, increase it over time. Using a trial frame would be most helpful um, in this case. And we'll do some examples of these as well. If you're making larger than a half a diopter cylindrical change, you may not want to give the entire change. You may, again, similar with the sphere, want to um, give part of it and then increase it slowly over time. If it's a high amount of astigmatism, or if it's a first pair of glasses for someone, um, or even if it's the first time that they're getting cylindrical correction, if they've worn glasses but it's only been spherical, you do want to proceed with caution. Uh, using, again, the trial frame will be most helpful in the situation to determine um, what you're going to actually end up prescribing. And you may not give the full change, you may give part of it, and then once the patient adapts to that, then you may give them a new um, prescription later on over time. But you may initially start with a lower prescription um, for adaptation purposes. Also, you want to make sure that you are taking into consideration the sphere power if you're making changes to the cylindrical power and maintaining the spherical equivalent. So the calculation that we use for maintaining the spherical equivalent is that you take the sphere and you add half the cylindrical power 
of the change that you're making to the cylinder. So we're gonna go through a few examples of this. Um, I'm not sure what everyone's level of familiarity is with um, spherical equivalent calculations. So I wanted to make sure that we all had a good understanding of the concept because we'll be talking about this throughout the lecture. So we have our first question here. Uh, a patient's subjective refraction of the right eye is minus three, minus two at axis 180. What is the spherical equivalent? So I'm asking if you were to take all of the cylinder power out and just give a sphere powered lens to this patient, what would the spherical equivalent be? All right, excellent. So most of us are on the same page, great. So the answer is minus four. Oh, let me go back to that. So uh, the way you do the calculation is it's sphere plus half the sill. So if we're taking out all of the minus two cylindrical power, half of that would be minus one. So the spherical equivalent would be minus three plus minus one, which gives us minus four. That's a big change though, to take out two full diopters of cylindrical power would almost definitely reduce that patient's visual acuity. And so more often what we're doing is just reducing the amount of cylindrical correction, not taking it out completely. And so that's our next example. So if you take the same patient, uh, but you decide you don't want to take all of the two diopters of cylindrical correction out, just one diopter, um, what would the sphere power, I have what would the RX be, but what would the sphere power be if you reduce the cylindrical power of this prescription here um, to minus one? And this is done very commonly, I'm sure most of you are already doing this. Again, I'm mostly including these calculations to, to be sure that we're all on the same page so that I'm not using terms or techniques that anyone's not familiar with. Um, but this is done, I do this on a daily basis uh, when seeing patients in clinic because we want to make sure that the new prescription that we give will be comfortable. Excellent. So most of us put minus 350. That is exactly right. So uh, I have here, so that would be the sphere power. So again, we're taking the sphere plus half the cylinder. But in this case now, we're only cutting the cylinder by one. So half that is minus 0.5. So minus three plus minus 0.5 is minus 350. And so this is what we might end up prescribing um, for this patient. We'll do just a couple more examples using plus powered lenses because you know that changes the calculation a bit. So similar situation, but now the patient's left eye is plus 1.5 minus one, axis 90. So what would the spherical equivalent be? Same thing if you took out all the um, cylindrical power and we're just going to give uh, a sphere prescription to this patient. Excellent, right. So most of us put plus one, perfect. And our last example here, similar concept to before, we're not going to take out all of the cylindrical power, just half. So what would the sphere power be uh, if you reduce the cylinder by half a diopter? Great, most people put plus 1.25, that's exactly right. So this changes the calculation a bit. So if we're reducing it by 0.5, uh, and we're taking the sphere plus half the sill, the half the cylinder power now is minus 0.25. So plus 1.5 uh, plus minus 0.25 would be plus 1.25. And this would be the prescription um, that you might end up with. And the reason that I'm including these questions, I see the vast majority of us are getting this right. Uh, so you're already familiar with this, but we will build on this, especially when we talk about what we might trial frame. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that we were all on uh, the same page with this concept. Uh, when it comes to making a change to the cylinder axis, you do have to be careful if you're making a larger change of say more than 15 degrees. Uh, if it's a high cylindrical power, so maybe two diopters of, or more, two and a half diopters or more, you may not want to change the axis at all. You may want to keep the axis the same and just change the power, 
or make very minimal changes to the axis because five degrees for someone that wears three diopters of cylindrical correction is a very large change. But 15 degrees for someone that wears, you know, a half a diopter of cylindrical correction is maybe not quite as noticeable. And I talked earlier that there are normal fluctuations, so keep that in mind, especially if you're getting, you know, a quarter diopter difference between the patient's existing glasses and what you're finding on subjective refraction. That again, unless the patient is very sensitive to small changes, um, I'm going to be less likely to change a prescription by a quarter diopter unless it's indicated. Trial framing. So this um, I do very, very often. So typically I um, refract using a phoropter. And so that is not a very good real world simulation. So most often what we'll do is refract in the phoropter. And then when we're trying to determine what to prescribe, if there is a large change happening, like what we're talking about today, we will put that in a trial frame. For those of you that are already doing trial frame refractions, this is even easier because you have the lenses in the trial frame. Um, you could have the patient look around, you could have them walk around. If you're in a room, you could have them leave the room, go into a larger space so that they get a sense of how it feels to be wearing the refractive correction, especially if it's a large change. When should you trial frame? So there's not, again, a hard and fast rule. I gave you some numbers here. It's more of a recommendation. If you're making a change of a diopter or more to the sphere, 0.7 diopters or more in the cylinder, 15 degrees or more for the cell axis. Again, this is all what we just talked about. Or if the patient's coming back with the glasses you prescribed saying that they don't feel right and they want you to check the prescription, trial framing in that case would also be um, very helpful. So we have an example. Um, if we have a 36 year old patient that comes in wearing this prescription, um, their acuity is about 2030 and 2040 plus two. So their acuity uh, in the distance is a little bit reduced. So on subjective refraction, you're getting a full diopter more of cylindrical correction with the five degree axis change in the right eye that does improve their visual acuity. And you're getting a, a quarter diopter change of sphere in the right eye with another diopter change uh, in the left eye with also a five degree axis change. So what could you trial frame in this case? So some of the things you could show the patient, and this is usually the, the order that I would show the patient. And this is something I talk about with, with students all the time. Uh, very often, I think my students interpret trial framing as just showing the patient the prescription that they found, or not the prescription, but the, the subjective refraction uh, in a trial frame. But that's not exactly what trial framing is, right? So I would probably start by showing the patient some kind of combination. So cutting the cylindrical power by half diopter, keeping the spherical equivalent, showing it with the new axis in the right eye. Same thing with the left eye. So cutting that uh, cylindrical power, keeping the spherical equivalent, showing with the new axis. I'd ask the patient, you know, how does this feel? How do things look? And then I might show them the same powers, but with the different axes. So show them the difference between the old axis and the new axis and see if they notice any difference. If they don't notice any difference, then I might keep their, their old axis, the, the 165 and the 140. Um, and then I might show them the full prescription, right? So I probably in this case, um, if the patient was complaining that they noticed their vision was blurry, I probably would not show them their current prescription. If they said their vision was fine, I might have started with this and then worked my way up to the changes with cutting of the sill um, and then show them the full subjective refractive findings. But this is usually the stepwise process of what I would show the patient to determine what they would be most comfortable in. What are they appreciating clear and comfortable vision in? So here we go, we have another question. So if our patient has the following habitual prescription 
and with some reduced vision and you um, find an increase in plus power and incre an increase in cylindrical power with an axis change in the right eye. Same thing, increase in plus power for the sphere, increase in cylindrical power and a change in the axis in the left eye, which improves the acuity. What would you trial frame for the right eye specifically? All right, so we sort of got a bit of a mix here all over the place with the most people putting the C. So um, this is a little bit of a trick question and I think I usually include something like this in all my lectures, but technically you could have trial framed any of those options. So there is no wrong answer here. Um, I think if you, if the question was, if you could only trial frame one of these options, what would it be? then that may be different. But if you're just trying to pick what you might show the patient in a trial frame, really you can show them any of these options. So if you showed them A, you would just be showing them what their, currently, what their current prescription is. And you could use that as a reference point and say, this is what's in your current pair of glasses. How does it compare to this? And then make a change and show them the change. You could also show them B, which would just be cutting the, um, the sphere power but keeping the cylindrical power and the axis that you found and the, um, sorry, keeping the habitual axis, but increasing the cylindrical power and then just cutting the amount of plus. Um, you could also cut the cylindrical power, keep it at the new axis, but keep the spherical equivalent. And so that's what most people put. That is probably what I would have started with or if I only had one to choose, uh, I would choose C. Or you can show the patient the full, um, nearly the full prescription. Uh, oh, actually, yes, no, in the right eye would be the full new um, subjective refractive findings. And realistically, you would be showing the patient more than one of these options and comparing and getting the patient's feedback. How does this feel? Is it comfortable? How do things look? Is it clear? Is it clear, but it's uncomfortable? Because if it's clear and uncomfortable, I'm then concerned about whether or not they'll adapt to the prescription, and then I might not give that um, ref those refractive findings. I may reduce the prescription even more. So if I were to show the patient D, and they said everything looks really clear, but I don't feel comfortable, if you gave them that as their final prescription, they may have trouble adapting. They may adapt, but you know already in the exam room they're uncomfortable in it. Uh, and so if that were my decision to make, if this was my patient, I would probably go with C. If, they were, if it was clear and uncomfortable in D and they said it was clear more or less, um, but comfortable in C, then I would give them C. That's why trial framing is so um, important and helpful. Patient education is um, critical for any change. If you're making large changes, pretty much any time I make a large change or if I'm giving a new glasses prescription to begin with, I will include education on adaptation, something like um, if you put the glasses on and it's not totally comfortable at first, that's normal. Um, don't take the glasses off and, and not wear them. The more you wear the glasses at first, the faster the adaptation will take place. If you, I'll tell them, if you wear the glasses all day, every day for a week and it still doesn't feel comfortable, then come back because we may need to make a change. And I'm trying to avoid that at all costs. I don't want the patient to be comfortable. I don't want them to have to come back and take the time to come back. Um, so I will always include that as part of the patient education so that the patient knows what to expect. But also I've taken all these other steps, um, including usually trial framing, to try and ensure that adaptation is not a problem for the patient. Also something to consider is um, letting the patient know what their prognosis is. So depending on their refractive status, if they have myopia, should they be expecting it to get worse? How quickly will it get worse? Will it plateau at some time? Um, I know this is a very um, uh, hot topic now, so that may come up, but also patients that are presbyopic. Um, 
letting them know you may not need reading glasses for everything now, but at some point you may be much more, you'll probably be much more reliant on reading glasses or patients that are maybe low hyperopes their whole life and maybe don't need any glasses. Usually I'll tell them, well, you may not have needed glasses up until this point. Uh, and then all of a sudden you needed reading glasses and now all of a sudden you need glasses for everything. So that would not be uncommon. And so I will usually include that as part of the patient education so that they know what to expect. Patients also have a right to their own preferences if um, they prefer a weaker prescription because it's more comfortable and it doesn't interfere with any of their visual demands, um, then, then that's perfectly fine. Prescribing considerations for the different age groups. So I am going to include some information on um, considerations for the pediatric patient population. But again, this is really beyond the scope of this talk. So I'm mostly just including this for informational purposes, for reference material, so that if you did want to come back to this talk and refer to the slides, that the information would be there. Um, but this is, again, beyond the scope of this talk, prescribing specifically for amblyopia, um, is not really um, in, in my specialty. Um, but again, I felt that I should at least include this information so that you would have it. Um, so the primary concern with pediatric patient population is um, preventing amblyopia if there are amblyogenic risk factors. So because we're talking about spectacle prescribing here, um, we would probably mostly be concerned with um, refractive amblyo amblyogenic risk factors. And so I included this table here, again, just for reference. So if we're looking at anisometropia an an or isometropia, this will give you the refractive, um, de the degrees of refractive error that could be amblyogenic for hyperopia, myopia, and astigmatism. Again, just here for reference. Um, this was adapted from a review article looking at prescribing guidelines for infants and children. Uh, again, we're not going to go through this step by step, but I included it um, so that you would have it. Uh, also, I included the table. This is the exact table from the review article so that you could have this to review back to. This is specifically for infants and children. And so I have these tables for myopia, also for astigmatism, same thing. This is for infants and children. Um, and then I took the same table because I um, sort of made this a little bit easier to see it by putting it into a table format, but then I copied and pasted the actual table from the review article um, so that we would have this uh, in the presentation as well. When it comes to age and astigmatism, as I said before, the priority is on avoiding amblyopia. As children get older, so between the ages of five to 10, you could probably give the full cylindrical correction. Um, and children tend to adapt much easier to astigmatic correction than adults do, so you don't have to be quite as concerned with adaptation issues. Older children, if they're 10 up through their teenage years, usually you give the full correction um, but depending on how high the astigmatism is, you may also be um, concerned with um, adaptation, although it's much less of a concern uh, in the pediatric population. For adults, definitely you have to concern, uh, you have to consider spatial distortions or any issues that they might have with adaptation. And this goes back to all the examples we just talked about um, with reducing the amount of cylindrical correction using trial framing to do that, uh, making sure that you're keeping the spherical equivalent. You may increase the amount of cylindrical correction over time as the patient gets more and more used to having that correction in their glasses. You could try and change or move the axes to 180 or 90 as opposed to more oblique angles, but that may not always be possible. Um, or as we talked about before, you could keep the same axis that the patient is used to and just change the power um, there. Age and hyperopia, there are um, many more considerations when it comes to prescribing for hyperopia. So how much hyperopia? Do they have astigmatism as well or anisometropia? How old is this patient? Um, do they have 
any type of tropia, more specifically esotropia, since we're prescribing plus lenses, may that help with the esotropia or not? Um, do they have amblyopia or are there amblyopic, amblyogenic risk factors? What is their accommodative and binocular status? What are their visual demands and do they have any symptoms? So this is again that same table and I, as you can see, I included the table because it's a lot of information that's very condensed. So again, that's why I included it. Um, there's also, it says here, you know, outside the 95% range of refraction. Uh, and so I included this reference table that gives you the age and months with the 95% upper and lower ranges um, of refractive findings so that you could come back to this, um, so that you could refer back to this. Um, not that we're, again, we're not going to go into the in-depth details in this talk. For the management of older children and then into the adult age for hyperopia, if there's moderate hyperopia, uh, they're more likely to need at least part-time correction, usually for near vision only. If uh, they have high hyperopia, they may need full-time spectacle correction for distance and near. Um, and the full-time correction also helps to aid in adaptation so that the eyes can relax and they're not used to accommodating all the time. Vision therapy may or may not be indicated. And um, it, patients that are in sort of the 30 to 40, although it's usually the sort of late 30s to early 40 range, uh, may be more likely to be symptomatic, particularly if it's moderate to high hyperopia uh, and are more likely to need correction. And um, that may or may not include, you know, single vision for full-time wear, or once the patient starts to get into maybe their early 40s, late 30s, early 40s, um, they may also need a, a bifocal prescription. If there's latent hyperopia, you want to be looking for or listening for symptoms like blur, but then also asthenopia, patients saying their eyes feel tired, they're getting headaches that are associated with near work, uh, and same thing uh, that we just talked about, you may prescribe glasses for reading only or bifocals. Presbyopia uh, may necessitate full-time correction. It depends on the patient's distance refractive findings. They may just be able to use reading only, uh, or they may need two separate pairs of glasses, one for distance, one for reading, or something like a bifocal or a progressive. Uh, as we talked about before, letting the patient know what their prognosis is, if there is progression that's expected with age, and really age is the best predictor uh, of um, add value. And so I included our table here for reference that for what age predicted ads are. And really when I think about this, the way that I've always remembered um, what the age predicted ad should be is by sort of focusing in on at 45, someone should need around a plus one ad, and at 55, someone should need around a plus two ad, and then sort of fill in the gaps, the rest of those values between. So between 45 and 55, they'll need some something between a plus one and a plus two, and above 55, they'll need something between a plus two and a 250. When someone is older than 65, usually they'll need at least a plus 250 ad, but it could be higher uh, if they have reduced near vision. Um, this usually happens in cases with pathology present. So if there's age-related macular degeneration or cataracts, something that's affecting the central vision, but you, need to be aware of the impact that's going to have on the working distance. So the higher the ad, the closer the working distance. And so if the patient is not able or willing to hold print closer, um, then prescribing that higher ad may not be helpful. Also, lighting becomes very important at this point. So we have another question here. So if we have a 58-year-old patient, they come in, this is their habitual prescription, they're wearing a plus 150 ad, so they have a slightly reduced vision at distance, somewhat reduced vision at near. You find these, your subjective refractive findings are here, so small increase in 
distance plus power, some cylindrical power change, a little bit of axis change in the right eye. Um, some again, minor changes to sphere, slightly larger change to the sill, same axis, but it improves the best corrected vision. So what would be the most appropriate add power for this patient? All right, so most of us put plus two, and there's a little bit more of a mix between plus 175 and plus 225. Uh, so I really thought that something between a plus two and a plus 225 would probably work for this patient. Plus 175, um, possibly. Uh, really, if we look at, if we sort of go back to that age is the best predictor of the needed add, then since this patient is 58, so at 55, you need around a plus two. Um, so somewhere between a plus two and a plus 225 might work, but uh, the plus 175 could potentially work considering we are giving more plus power at distance. So that's already going to be increasing the plus power at near. So this is where showing the patient the difference between the plus 175, plus two, or plus 225 would be the most effective way to figure out what your final add power is going to be. But something in the vicinity of a plus two is really what you should be aiming for for this patient. Environmental consider, uh, considerations, so knowing what the patient's um, visual needs are, their work environment, their um, life environment, what are their um, working distances, what are the tasks that they may be doing, um, how do they plan on using the glasses. So a lot of times I'll ask a patient, do you want to wear the glasses all the time or do you just want to put them on for certain tasks? And some patients will say, no, I don't want to wear them all the time. You know, someone may say, oh, I, I sew and I do a lot of detailed sewing work. And so I just want to put the glasses on for that. But then I don't feel like I need them for anything else. That's fine. Other patients may say, no, I want to put the glasses on, wear them all the time because it's easier to keep track of that way. And if that's the case, then I may prescribe something like a bifocal or a progressive lens, depending on the patient's distance and near refractive findings, as well as their visual demands. Uh, what if a patient has a phacic? So it depends if it's monocular or binocular. Uh, if, it's, if they're aphakic only in one eye, that necessitates you know, a high plus spectacle lens, which is going to be extremely difficult to adapt to optically. Uh, and so in that case, Contact lenses may be an option uh, to reduce some of the prismatic difference that is experienced with spectacles. But realistically, what you may end up needing to do is just prescribing a balanced lens for the eye that's aphakic. This is again, all of this is if only one eye is aphakic. If they're both aphakic, then it's a bit different because then you would have the high plus power lenses in both eyes. Um, cosmetically, it would be very noticeable if you were wearing those high plus power spectacle lenses. So you may opt for contact lenses if that's possible. Um, but if only one eye is aphakic, then you have all these other adaptation challenges um, because of the optical uh, system. Pseudoaphakia is something else to consider if they have an intraocular lens implant, regardless of age, usually they'll need a plus 250 add unless the IOL uh, is multifocal or monovision design where one eye is correctable for distance and one eye is correctable for near. Uh, when we talk about spectacle design options, there are few different options out there, but they're very rarely prescribed. So I chose to focus mostly on task dependent spectacles. So what is the working distance? What is the visual demand? Uh, and how do we determine the power that's needed for a specific working distance? The way you do that is taking the reciprocal of the working distance in meters. And so I included some calculations here. So if someone has a working distance of 40 centimeters, uh, which is usually by convention, at least in the US, where we measure um, near acuities, the working distance, the, the demand, the accommodative demand for a working distance of 40 centimeters is two and a half diopters. The working, for a working distance of 33 centimeters, uh, if we do the calculation, that's about a three diopter accommodative demand. 
So if we have a patient, we have a little case here. If a patient uh, A is a 67-year-old male, and he works, he's still working, works all day at a computer, um, so it's computer distance and then up close reading. He's been noticing some blur uh, while using the computer with his current glasses. And so the first questions that I would ask this patient are, what is the current glasses prescription? So if the patient had the glasses, that would be the best option so that we could do lensometry to find out what power um, he's currently wearing. How far away is the computer? So that's determining the working distance. And then what type of glasses is he currently using? Is he using um, distance only, near only, um, a bifocal? What is he currently using? And we would need to know all this information so that we don't end up giving the patient exactly what he already has, which uh, clearly, according to him, is not working. So here's a question. So you are asking more questions and trying to find out what the patient's working distance is for his computer and find out that the working distance is 65 centimeters. So what would the accommodative demand be for this working distance? All right, excellent. So most people put one and a half diopters and that is correct. So this gives us more information about what add power he would need for something at an intermediate distance. The next measurement that's also helpful is knowing the range. Um, so knowing how much flexibility the patient has um, with their current glasses. Uh, and so if we measure patient's a, patient A's range of clear near vision through the following prescription, so let's say this is, these are our you know, distance refractive findings from the exam today, and he was given a plus 250 add. So through the plus 250 add, the range of clear near vision is 35 to 45 centimeters. So could the patient use this prescription as a bifocal? So if we're considering giving this as a bifocal, could he use this for the computer? And remember, his computer working distance was 65 centimeters. Okay, so most people said no, uh, and then there's a bit of a mix between yes, maybe, and I need more information. So realistically, no. Um, so since the, the add power, the range of clear vision does not include the 65 centimeters, he's not going to be able to use the bifocal to see through the glasses. Uh, and if you were thinking maybe he could use his distance portion of a bifocal to see the computer, that's probably not going to happen either because he needs, as we said, at least a diopter and a half of accommodation to be able to see at the computer distance at where his working distance is. And even if he could squeeze out just enough uh, accommodation to clear that diopter and a half, he's definitely not going to be able to do it all day since he said he's on the computer and reading all day. So realistically, he's not going to be able to use the distance portion of the glasses for the computer. He's not going to be able to use the, the near um, portion of the bifocal for the computer. So this is not going to help him. So if we updated his glasses prescription and gave him a new bifocal prescription, we didn't really solve the problem. So what are some of his options? Progressives, right? So that would include that intermediate distance um, power lens uh, or a trifocal. That would definitely work well. Usually a trifocal is about half the power of the, the full power add. So in this case, if the full add that we're giving is plus 250, um, the trifocal power would probably be about uh, plus 125, which would probably be adequate. So trifocal is an option. He could use computer only glasses. So if you gave him a single vision pair of glasses, that could just be for the computer. But the problem with that is that it wouldn't include distance or near. So if he's working at the computer distance and up close for reading, then he wouldn't be able to read. So another option, if you did want to go with a bifocal, you could but only if the top portion of the lens was for an intermediate distance, so if it was for the computer, and then the near portion uh, was for closer for reading. So the only, you couldn't give the bifocal for distance and near, 
but you could give a bifocal for intermediate and near. Um, and so these are pretty much all the options that he has, although the computer spectacles, I probably would not do in this case, um, again, because that would um, really only limit him to the computer distance. If he said he was only working on the computer, maybe, but that's less likely. So really the progressives, trifocal or intermediate near bifocal would be the best options for this patient. All right, so I did want to leave a little bit of time for questions. So uh, I will work my way through as many questions as I have, um, as many questions as I can at this point. Uh, I saw earlier in the um, presentation, someone asked about using the duochrome test. Uh, and I think that was in reference to if a patient was, um, if we suspected that someone was over minus when I had recommended not reducing um, minus for myopes. You could use the duochrome test, um, but I think in all likelihood you would might find that they are over minus. I think the the thing to consider is whether or not they are used to being over minus um, and are comfortable in that because even if you use the duochrome and you are feeling comfortable in determining that they're over minus, um, you still might keep the prescription the same because uh, you run the risk of if you reduce the myopic prescription that they may all start to experience blur because they are so used to having um, that slight over minus. And again, this is if they are not symptomatic. If they are symptomatic for asthenopia or headaches, then I'm much more likely to lower the prescription and to explain to them why I'm doing that. Uh, someone else asked a question about trial framing. If it's done monocularly after binocular subjective refraction or binocularly. So usually I uh, only trial frame binocularly. Uh, and this is something I know I talk about a lot when I'm in clinic with my interns. Um, the, the purpose, so the subjective refraction is to help us to find out what the best corrected acuity is. The trial framing is helping us figure out function, not necessarily acuity. So I want to know if the patient's comfortable. So I'm doing this trial frame binocularly. If I'm taking acuity, which most of the time I'm not, but if I am, it would also be binocular because trial framing for this purpose is to determine function, not necessarily um, best corrected acuity because we've already done that. Um, so the next question is, what is the importance of trial framing for prescribing new correction? So uh, I think it depends on the power of the new prescription. If it's, um, if it's a low prescription, low, plus, minus, or astigmatic correction. It may not be necessary, but if it's a bit stronger and you're questioning whether or not the patient will adapt, then trial, trial framing will be helpful in that process. So it's not necessary, but it could be important if you're concerned that because it's a first prescription, the patient may have difficulty adapting to it. Uh, is trial framing useful in children? Uh, Usually not. <laughs> so uh, usually we're uh, with younger patients, we are basing it, uh, basing our prescribing on objective findings. Um, so not even the subjective findings. If you are, are able to get any seven, I mean, from a, a seven-year-old patient, you'll, you'll probably be able to get subjective findings, but trial framing probably won't be as useful. So in the pediatric patient population, um, I'm less likely to trial frame, although it's not, um, not that you shouldn't at all, but it will be less helpful because we're not as concerned about trial framing for adaptation. So we're not trying to necessarily figure out function. Uh, so a lot of times our findings are based on objective findings um, and, and that's about it. And we're not as worried about adaptation. So trial framing in that case is not helpful. Although, I, um, doing a trial frame refraction is much more common in the pediatric patient population. So you may be, the patient may already be in a trial frame, but for subjective refraction, as opposed to because you are trial framing to try and figure out what you want to give as your final prescription. Um, let's see, we have a, looks like a little case here. If the patient's 30 years old and had surgery for congenital cataract, 
Before surgery, he wore minus 175. After the surgery, he's minus 175 in the right eye, 2020, and plus, I'm guessing 175, minus one, axis 175 and is 2060. What will you recommend for this patient? So um, because you have the anti-metropia there, right? So one eye is minus and one eye is plus. Uh, I'm assuming the congenital cataract was just in the left eye. In all likelihood, this is going to be uncomfortable. You could show it to the patient, but the likelihood that I would prescribe this is very low. I would probably end up giving a balanced lens um, in the left eye. Again, this is where trial framing uh, is very helpful, um, but potentially a contact lens uh, could be a consideration or using a balanced lens. So this is almost sort of similar <clears throat> to um, if your patient was aphakic, although the prescription is much lower, so it's much more likely that the patient could tolerate the difference. So trial framing will be really helpful here, but because of the antimetropia, um, it could be optically difficult to adapt to. So I would show the trial framing options like we talked about before, but sort of always knowing in the back of my mind that I may need to consider a contact lens uh, or a contact lens fit um, or a balanced lens uh, in that left eye. Let's see, what is the time between changing the RX and increasing power? So that's a really good question because uh, I know I didn't talk about that at all. Usually, uh, unless uh, the vision is very reduced because of the amount that you cut, which usually I will not do that, um, I will usually keep the patient in the prescription for a year um, and then have them come back and see how they're doing. But if, um, yeah, I mean, in, in the pediatric population, usually you might make changes more often than that, but then in the adult population, uh, usually I will um, probably not make changes uh, until the next year. Uh, let's see, for hyperopes in their 20s and early 30s that can't adapt to even the most modest of plus correction, I know exactly what you're talking about there, I prescribe lenses and usually these patients are satisfied. However, I'm generally not sure how much hyperopia I should correct using lenses. Any recommendations? Yeah, so that's going to be so variable based on the patient and the amount of hyperopia. One of the things, you know, if the amount of plus uh, will improve their either acuity or improve their symptoms, um, I will usually take into consideration the dry refractive findings and the wet refractive findings, wet being a cycloplegic refraction, um, and see is there some latent hyperopic component. And so then comparing the two, see how much plus I might end up prescribing. But usually, actually, I think the most important thing to, con to include is the patient education. And a lot of times I'll tell these patients, when you put these glasses on, it will probably be blurry. And uh, your eyes will need time to adjust and relax so that they accept the, the glasses power and then things will get clear, but it will probably be a little bit blurry at first. And that's part of that adaptation. But usually um, I will probably uh, go with a lower plus power, but I think um, an important piece to know is if there is any latent hyperopia there, um, because you could probably push a little bit more plus for someone that has some latent hyperopia uh, than for someone that doesn't. So it really depends on the case, and I hope I included enough information there. Um, Let's see, so for seven years, a seven-year-old child, their vision is 20-20 in the right eye and has a cylindrical correction of minus one, axis 90, and is 20-20. Um, do we prescribe glasses or follow the child? So um, I would, first I would recommend going back to um, the table that I included as sort of as, as reference because a seven-year-old would be sort of that older child, uh, uh, child demographic. Uh, but in this case, you know, if the child is already seven, that one diopter sill is um, just below uh, that amblyogenic risk factor. And we already know that they're able to receive 20-20 vision. So um, in this case, I think, again, one of the things we're 
trying to consider is, is there an embryogenic risk factor? And in this case, um, no. And the child is already seven. They're able to be corrected to 2020. So in this case, um, you may not need to prescribe the glasses, but I would definitely, uh, this is just my general answer, but I would refer you back to um, the table from the presentation with more um, specifics on that. Um, you could, uh, one last thing I would say about that is that depending, if they're older now and becoming school age, which around seven usually they are, um, you may prescribe it um, if they have symptoms. And in that case, you could give the full cylindrical correction. Um, so some of it will also depend on function there. Um, okay, can I please show the references again? I don't know which one specifically. Um, let's see. So I think I have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, so I'm not sure someone asked if I could show the, the references again. Oh, if, did you mean just the references slide? Because if that's the case, then I can definitely do that. Um, but then I would just sort of recommend going back to the recording of the webinar um, and uh, to look at the specific slides. Uh, but these are just the general references. The number three reference is the, the article um, with prescribing guidelines. It's a great um, reference article. When do you binocular balance before or after trial framing? So that would be done before. Um, that would be done uh, usually because I refract with a phoropter at the end of subjective refraction. Um, and so I have those findings. And then after that, I would trial frame. Would you recommend a difference in near addition power for presbyopes between eyes? Uh, usually not, uh, usually, and I think a lot of this somewhat is, is by convention, um, but usually you would not prescribe different ads and part of that has to do with balancing accommodation. Even if someone is a presbyope, if they're an early presbyope, they are still able to accommodate. And so assuming that you've, you know, done your proper distance subjective refraction, you have now balanced out. Uh, the accommodation, and if you introduce different power ads, then you're creating an unequal amount of accommodation, which could be uncomfortable for the patient. So usually the ad power is given um, equally between the two eyes. On a, there could be an exception to that, but most of the time the power is going to be the same between the two eyes. Um, so the last question I think I'll answer because of time is, what is the difference between progressives um, and trifocal glasses. So the progressive lenses are um, a, a no line, um, well, we sort of refer to it as a no line bifocal, but it's much more than that. So uh, the progressive lenses have your distance prescription at the top of the lens, and then gradually um, there is an increase in near addition power from the middle of the lens down towards the bottom. Uh, and so in between you get this gradation of near addition powers. And so if the patient sort of adjusts their head um, and where they're sitting and their working distance, they can find a clear portion of the lens to look through to see clearly through the glasses. But there's a gradation. So pretty much every uh, amount of near add power between you know, what your distance prescription is and the full near add is included in a progressive, whereas a trifocal is lined. So it has the distance prescription on the top, that intermediate add in the middle portion and then the near portion in the bottom. So there are very discrete differences between those three levels, whereas the progressive, there's more of a, a gradual gradient between them. Um, and so that's why the progressive is usually the most useful because if you move your head and uh, adjust where you look through the lenses, you can find a power um, that is helpful. Whereas the trifocal, again, because of the power is going to, um, have very discrete differences between each segment. All right, so I'm sorry I did not get a chance to get to all of your questions, but thank you so much for joining us for this webinar and I hope that it was helpful. All right, thanks again.